right in the middle, almost smack dab in the middle of the seventh chapter, is this interesting, I don't know, kind of sudden, turn the steering wheel suddenly, jerk it to the right. Um, he seems to come out of the context of marriage, relationships, what's a justifiable divorce, what isn't, uh, to suddenly move into an arena that I'm titling today, um, what kind of a life has the Lord assigned to you? What kind of a life has the Lord assigned to you? Because listen to what he says to two specific groups of people here, sort of suddenly, starting in verse 17 of the 7th chapter of 1 Corinthians. He says, Only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, in this manner, let him walk. And so I direct in all the churches. Was any man called when he was already circumcised? He is not to become uncircumcised. Has anyone been called in uncircumcision? He is not to be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing uncircumcision is nothing. But what matters is the keeping of the commandments of God. Each man must remain in that condition in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not worry about it. But if you are also able to become free, rather do that. For he who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who was called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. Uh, did you notice something here? Did you notice we've got some bookends happening here? Um, in verse 17, as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, in this matter let him walk or let him live, and so I direct in all the churches. And then in 24, brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. And in between both of those, we've got two life circumstances, two life situations uh, that are going on here. One has to do with folks who uh, had been circumcised or had circumcision put on them. Sounds like some Jewish folks who had come to faith in Christ to become believers. And now, you know, they're considering becoming uncircumcised and you might think well wait a minute I think I know what circumcision is how do you change that you know and then you got others who are thinking about becoming circumcised and Paul is speaking directly to those people saying no and no <laughs> no don't worry about becoming uncircumcised and you over here make sure you don't become circumcised and then he speaks about people who are in a slavery condition and you've read through the New Testament epistles you know that Paul especially had many different uh, times in the epistles spoken to the believing slaves that were in the various congregations as well as to the masters when the people would come together as a church that social distinction would drop in other words uh, the, they were the masters did not treat their slaves as slaves during the time of fellowship, there was equality there because they were at equal footing regarding being saved the same way at the cross. Uh, but then he would speak some practical things. But now, what's he doing? Well, he's responding to some questions here. Now, verse 18, as I introduce this to you a little bit, when he says, was any man called when he was already circumcised? He's now to become uncircumcised. Apparently, they've got some some believers here that are considering either being circumcised or uncircumcised. So it's like here is this thing that was done to them. Now they've come to Christ. Now it's like those who have been circumcised, like the little boys when they're eight days old, now it's like, well, I want to make that complete break with Judaism, with that former life, because I'm in Christ now. Shouldn't I have some kind of an operation? We'll talk about that because there was such a thing available um, in that time, in the first century. And this was done to me, and it made me think, as I was looking at this, it made me think, wait a minute, what about, what about you know, things that have been done to us by others uh, prior to being in Christ? And we're carrying that around with us into our Christian experience. Has anybody cut anything off from you? Has anybody damaged you? Has anybody deformed you? 
uh, prior to Christ or maybe while in Christ? Is that something I need to concern myself with? And Paul is, remember, chapter 7, verse 1. What's he doing? Chapter 7, verse 1. Now concerning the things about which you wrote. And he's answering these various questions. And so as he finishes up in uh, chapter, really, chapter 7, verses 10 through, through uh, 16, dealing with the whole marriage between believers and unbelievers, and is there sunio decayo, you know, has, has one uh, carizo, has one left, departed from the other, you know, and he, he, he goes in verse 16 for those who are hedging as to whether, you know, they should pursue that unbeliever that has left the marriage, he says in 16, how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? How do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? idea being is that they are presumptuously thinking, no, I'm going to stay in this marriage even though there has been a break, a biblical break, which leaves no marriage anymore according to what God's Word says, that I'm going to pursue this thing because it might lead to their salvation. He's saying, first of all, that's a presumptuous sin. To think that you would have any salvific effect on your unbelieving spouse who has now corizoed from you, has separated themselves from you, whether physically or philosophically and religiously and that kind of a thing, it's still Carrizo. He's saying it's presumptive to think that. If the unbeliever has departed, like he said, let them depart, right? And then he suddenly jumps in. It's almost like a sudden jerk of the wheel to the right or to the left. You're driving along and it's all nice and smooth and all of a sudden, whoa, let's go over here. And he says in 17, the, there the Lord has assigned a certain thing along with our calling in life that is not to be suddenly changed. And he starts talking about circumcised people. And I'm starting to think about what about people, you know, in our congregation who have had things cut off from them, ripped off, something like that. Should they do anything about that? Should they take the steps to have that repaired? I wonder what that might be. Or is their calling in Christ and their salvation sufficient in and of itself to repair that thing that was lost, that was taken from you? Is your position and your relationship with Christ sufficient to do that? Or does it require something more? I think that's what he's saying here. Then he speaks about individuals who were saved, called, while they were in slavery. He does that in verse 21 and 22. If you were saved while you were in a slave op your op occupation, is it mandatory to get out of that? Um, there's a sense in which this, these Corinthians seem to be asking Paul. See, we have to read between the lines here a little bit, figuring out what is, is being asked of Paul. There seems to be a sense in which there were some slaves in the congregation who were basically saying, hey, you know, in Christ, I shouldn't have to be a slave anymore. I should be let out of this. I should be let out of this. And we're going to talk about what Roman slavery was uh, in the Roman Empire. But, but it's almost like they're asking Paul for the green light to have this sudden societal, social rebellion against masters, slaves suddenly jerking themselves, running away from masters. Paul's not going to have anything to do with that, quite frankly. Uh, Paul's not saying slavery is okay, but Paul is recognizing that the gospel is not here to start a social uproar relative to a societal situation regarding slavery. Right? But now, what does that say to you and I? Really, a slave lives uh, under the pleasure or by the pleasure of someone or something else. And so, what are you a slave to? Who is running your life? Sometimes the, the, the debts we get into, we become slaves to that, don't we? A lot of people we know, and maybe some of us, you know, have become slaves to I don't know, a credit card or something like that. And you end up serving that thing. Um, but Proverbs talks about the fact that the, the borrower is the slave to the lender. And we really are, you know. But there's this slavery aspect. What bearing does Christianity now have on that? Or what does it have on our occupation? Maybe I feel like I'm a slave to my job. I just hate this job kind of a thing. He said, man, in Christ, I ought to be able to, 
you know, just I just want to start something totally new and walk away from this job. You know, why you've got responsibilities, why you've got a family, why you've got bills to pay. N- no, no. But he had, Paul actually had people asking questions like that. And then in verse 23, he talks about the fact that we as Christians were bought with a price, do not become slaves of men. That through Christ's purchase of us, through his blood, the means of his blood, uh, you cannot be a slave to anyone or anything because you belong to Christ. So really it's a mindset, isn't it? It's a matter of thinking biblically, but I can still live in this circumstance that might be slavery to some, but guess what? Paul talks about being content, Philippians the fourth chapter, verses 10 through 13, being content in whatever situation I find myself in. I've learned to have much, I've learned to have little, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's Philippians 4.13. And that we hear a lot, but it's connected to those previous verses. So I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me has to do with living in a situation where you got lots as well as living in a situation where you all got no lots. (laughs) You just got a little, see? And so if you look at your outline, I have tried to divide this up in accordance with what the text is saying and then what Paul could be speaking to us today through this text. So first of all, since we talk about the circumcised folks within the church at Corinth, we want to talk first of all about what Paul presents as a circumcised life. It's a life chosen for you or done to you. Because normally, when a a, a Hebrew male was circumcised, it would be what, what? when They were eight-day-old little babies. They're brand new. They're hot off. The griddle. They didn't weren't asked. Do you, do you want to go through with this? I, I can't hear your answer. You know, it was just done, right? And ah, you know, no wonder they were screaming. What a violation, kind of a routine. All right, it was something that was done to them. So if we look at verses 17 and 18, only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, immediately we see we start zeroing in on those two words, assigned and called, right? Start zeroing in on that, assigned and called. So there's some sovereignty taking place here. God is sovereign in regards to your circumstance, in regards to the timing and occupation that you're in at the moment of your effectual calling for salvation. When you got saved, you were at a certain place in life, right? You're coming to Christ, and in this case, in the context here, it's a, it's a Hebrew individual who has heard the gospel. God has given them the effectual call. That call has been effectual and drew them to Christ, see, as opposed to the general call, which goes out to everybody, but the only ones who are going to respond to that are those who are given the effectual call within that general call. And they are now drawn to Christ, John 6, We see that. And... They're circumcised. They've had something done to them. When he gets into circumcision in this, in this situation here, it's important that we understand that this is not a positive statement he's making about circumcision. And there is nothing positive to say about that within the doctrine of the New Testament. It carries over from the Mosaic legislation. Of course, it originated when God told Abraham to circumcise himself. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit here. But it's, it's important to understand that the only meaning physical circumcision now has since the cross and resurrection of Christ, the only meaning that it now has is a meaning of damnation. A meaning of damnation. When this is performed, the New Testament teaches that is a damning effect. Let's let's catch this rather rapidly. In Galatians, the fifth chapter, and verses 1 through 12, I'm going to read this quick. Paul says this, Galatians 5, 1 through 12, It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm. Do not subject again to a yoke of slavery. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, first problem, Christ will be of no benefit at all to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. Well, there's a problem with that because according to chapter 3, verse 10, if you don't keep every jot and tittle of that law, you are under the curse. 
and the lake of fire is guaranteed for you. And guess what? As soon as you do the circumcision thing, that's an outward mark that binds you to that obligation. So you are physically stating in your flesh that because you can't keep it anyway because you're fallen in Adam, you're damned and going to the lake of fire. You're going to have to satisfy God's righteous requirement with sacrifice of yourself for all eternity. And the reason it's eternal is because God never will be satisfied. Once he's satisfied, then annihilationism would be true. He'd put you out of your misery. But he won't because you can't because you're fallen in Adam. You have to be pure and perfect. That's why Jesus had to be pure and perfect, the spotless Lamb of God. Verse 4, you, if you get circumcised, have been severed from Christ. Have you seen anything positive yet? Severed from Christ, obligated to keep the law. Christ will be of no benefit to you. You will be under a yoke of slavery. That's everything all the way up to verse 1. Look at verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. No, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Didn't we just read that in chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians? But what matters is faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? The Greek reads, who cut in on you as you're running? Somebody cut in on you on this race of faith and is telling these Galatians, you need to get circumcised. It's the Judaizers is who it is. And then look at 8. This persuasion to become circumcised did not come from him who calls you. Now that's flat out. God is not behind this idea of circumcision under the new covenant. Uh Uh-uh. You know the old covenant, it doesn't even exist anymore. Did you know that? The old covenant, it has no existence other than we read about it historically. But it it is of no force whatsoever. It can't be because we're under the new covenant. See? He says in verse 9, a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. I have confidence in you. And in the Lord that you will adopt no other view, but the one who is disturbing you will bear his judgment, whoever he is. Wow. But brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I persecuted? The stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. I wish that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. The Greek is nice. Go the whole way and just cut it off. Lop it off. That's what he's saying. Don't stop with that foreskin. Let's just cut the whole thing off. That's what you ought to do. Well, you know, if Paul was still under the Old Covenant, that would be a blasphemy, and he'd be in trouble. That would be a blasphemy. But he knows that that's gone now. And now to go back to it, well, you get the point. What's the origination and the meaning of circumcision? Look back at Romans 4. i got to give you this intro stuff, and then we'll start flying through those other verses. But i got to give you this intro stuff in order for this to impact you. In Romans 4, starting at verses 9 going through 12, Paul says, is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised? It's a blessing of salvation. For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. 10. How then or when was it then credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while he was circumcised, but while uncircumcised. See, he was credited as having righteousness before the sign of that was placed physically on his body. And that's what 11 says. And he received the sign of circumcision, so it's a sign of something, a seal, so it's a sphragis, that's a, that's a sign of ownership. It's a seal of the righteousness of faith which he had while uncircumcised so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised that righteousness might be credited to them and the father of circumcision to the, that would be the Jews to those who not only are of the circumcision the Jews but who also follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham while he was uncircumcised so the 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 evidence here and the emphasis here is upon faith and righteousness already owned by Abraham before he was physically circumcised physical circumcision is nothing more than a sign and a seal of Of what? That he was a law keeper? No! That he had the faith which resulted in righteousness. That's what circumcision was supposed to be all about. So every time a a little Jewish guy 
got that happening to him, his parents, of course, would raise him and point to him in regards to his, his obligations within the covenant. But if you take it all the way back to the origination point, which is Abraham, which is what Paul does here in Romans 4, we find out that that was all about that was all about making a physical statement concerning the righteousness of faith which he already had, which was given to him in the first place that he never owned. See? How things change, yes? And now here comes Acts 15. These Judaizers come following Paul and Barnabas around and they're going, oh man, no. They got to be circumcised and obey the law in order to be saved. No, man, have you got that backwards? Completely backwards. But that's what Paul is having to deal with right here. See, So what is true circumcision? Because there is a true circumcision that we have all participated in in the New Covenant. And it has nothing to do with the physical, does it? But the New Testament speaks about true current circumcision. It is, first of all, a circumcision of the heart performed by the Spirit. And that's Romans 2, verses 28 and 29. You can write it down. I'm not taking you there. It'll take too long. Romans 2, verses 28 and 29. True circumcision is done by the heart, is of the heart, by the Spirit. Second, it is a true circumcision as opposed to a physical circumcision, which Paul says is a mutilation. And that's in Philippians 3, verses 1 through 3. Philippians 3, Verses 1 through 3. Do you, need, do you need a hand, sis? I know you're by yourself today. Do you, do you need Madeline to help you out? Or? <laughs> okay. Is that okay? Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Madeline's hot on the heels. All right. Good to see you, sis. I'm sorry you're missing out on this. Mom will make you watch the YouTube when you get home. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for doing that. I just, you know, she's t Jen's by herself today because Tony had to stay home. And I was like, you know, mom needs help, huh? Mom needs help. Okay, go check it out. She'll probably bring you back. Uh, see ya. Sorry about that. Let a little break right there, you know, but it was just, I think Jen was just, it's too frustrating for her. So we need to stop and help her a little bit. All right, Philippians 3, verses 1 through 3. Paul says that anybody that gets circumcised now, kind of like what he just said in Gal uh, Galatians 5, it, it's a mutilation. It's what he calls it there. A very strong Greek right there. Very fascinating. And then three, the true current circumcision is a circumcision made without hands that actually removes the Adamic sin nature, which we have studied in the past. And that's Colossians 2, verses 11 through 12. Colossians 2, verses 11 through 12. So, and he calls that the circumcision, but it's made without hands, not physical. So there is a true circumcision. It's first of all of the heart by the spirit. Second of all, it's not to be confused with the old circumcision, which is a mutilation, but we are the true circumcision, Philippians 3, 1 through 3. But then there's also the circumcision that is made without hands, which is the removal of the body of the flesh. It's the sin nature, and it gets gone. Now, having said all of that, let me ram through this now, back in 1 Corinthians, the seventh chapter. I know that was a, a little longer than we normally take, but let's, let's roll through this. Verse 17, he says, Only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, in this manner, let him walk. So immediately you see the two words, zero in on the two words, assigned and called. Yes, God is sovereign over your living circumstances. He has assigned you in life relative to your circumstances. Yes, even if there are secondary causes, like let's say you or I sin and we bring ourselves into a bad position, a bad uh, situation, and it's not every bad situation because we sin, but you know that would be a secondary cause. Or if something else was done to us, you know, and we are brought into a bad situation, uh, you know, like let's say we're at work, you know, we're um, you know, there's some favor. Oh, I'm up for a job promotion and the other guy's up for it too, but the boss is really favoring the other guy. So the other guy gets the job because the boss favors it. And the Lord allows that. And we're like back here going, okay, I'm stuck back in this situation, you know, because they favored somebody else. Well, God is sovereign over that. Even though that person was involved, secondary cause, in bringing that decision to pass, it never would have passed unless God was saying, that's it. That's what I want. See, 
God is sovereign. And that's what Paul is trying to get across to these folks who are in a circumcised position, that God has assigned and called us or named us. He has named our living circumstance, even though there can also be secondary causes. Well, in that case, assigned and called, then he says in the middle of 17, in this manner, let him walk, peripateo for walk. In this manner, understand that God has assigned and called and named your situation. Now, walk in it. That means live in it, doesn't it? It means live out your your life in it, in this manner. Live your life as assigned and named by God. Well, what if I don't like my life? Well, you have to start asking yourself, how did I come to be in my current state of affairs? You know, maybe maybe it's the fault of somebody else. Maybe it's your fault. Maybe you had nothing to do with it. Maybe you were the innocent bystander. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to go in, in, in something like that. But, but maybe you're in your circumstance because choices you made don't line up to the Word of God, and maybe you need to repent. I don't know. I don't know. But you'll have to make that decision. I can't cover every possible scenario in a, you know, in a, in a short teaching time uh, like this. But I trust that I've given you enough things to think about that you can move in the right direction in regards to this. So when he says this, in this manner, let him walk, Paul then finishes this up in 17 by saying, and so I direct in all the churches. In other words, this teaching about living the life that God has assigned and called everyone to is the same for the Corinthians as it is for all the other churches. Paul's not playing favorites here. He says the same thing to all of the churches. And this is not the first time he is he has made a comment like this. You can mark down uh, chapter 11, verse 16. Chapter 11, verse 16. As well as chapter 16 and verse 1. Chapter 16 and verse 1. That's all part of it right there. And now, having said all that, he wants to direct his comments to two, uh, two different categories of people that have asked him a question about this. What about my circumcised situation? I'd like to have that surgery that everybody's talking about to change my circumcised scenario. Or should I become circumcised? Would that bring me closer to God? Kind of a, you know, we're kind of reading between the lines in regards to the questions here because we've got to go by his answers. Well, what does he have to say to those folks? Verse 18, he says, Was any man called when he was already circumcised, called when he was already circumcised. He is not to become uncircumcised, which, what is uncircumcised? Um, Interesting word that he's going to use here, but think about this for a second. Like I said to you earlier, the circumcision thing was done to the individual. Life and commitment to a religion that was chosen for that person. Now, the outside can be changed, but the inside cannot be changed just by a physical move like this. Only God can change the inside. So, I've talked to you about Romans 2, 28 and 29. I've talked to you about Colossians 2, 11 through 12, where there is a circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, that is for Christians. That there is a Colossians 2, 11, circumcision made without hands, which is the removal of the body of the flesh. They are called already circumcised. And this is, of course, the effectual calling when he talks about this calling here, not simply hearing uh, someone call you to Christ. Now, we have to understand that in the Roman world, in the Roman Greek, Greco world, Roman Empire, circumcision was an embarrassment in that world. What do I mean? Well, When the Jews started coming into, many of them wanted to come into the societal setting that was the Roman Empire and be involved in like the gymnasiums, uh, the gymnasiums uh, and or the Roman baths. In the gymnasiums, you exercise naked. That was the societal structure. The Roman baths, obviously naked again. Well, you know, the Jews would have this circumcised thing and they'd be around all these other Gentile guys and they're not circumcised. And of course they stand out and everybody sees it. And it was considered a real embarrassment on both sides of the fence. Um, There was a gentleman called Celsus, C-E-L-S-U-S, Celsus. He was a Roman encyclopedist. He was also uh, a physician. 
and he developed this surgical procedure for Jewish men that wanted full acceptance into Roman society uh, where uh, they could make a physical correction on this. He writes about this in the book called De Medicina, Latin, De Medicina, chapter 7, paragraph 25. I know each of you have a copy and you'll run right home and check this real quick, make sure I'm telling you the, the, the straight stuff on this. And so the Jews, would, many of these Jews would have this surgery because they want to be accepted as equal in this Roman society. I kid you not, they were it was like the newfangled thing, right? <laughs> the surgery was known as an epispatic, epispatic, and the ones who had this surgery done on them were called epispatics, okay? Epispatics. And epispatic literally means to draw over or pull over. And it was a development by which they would take, I'm just going to be so-so here, okay? Uh, take the skin and basically extend it, draw it over, pull it over that area so that you couldn't really see the circumcision. And I don't know, there's no photos or anything, how well it was actually done. I don't imagine a couple of Jewish guys that have it done, epispatics, looked at one another in the bath and went, ah, I see you went to Dr. Shlomo for that. If like there's going to be a difference or something like that. Okay, that went over real well. Back to the text. When Paul says, when Paul says 18, was any man called when he was already circumcised? He is not to become, the Greek is epispatic. I kid you not. He is not to become epispatic. Not to become epispaomai is the Greek. Do not become epispatic. In other words, what Paul is saying, guess what Paul is saying? Paul is actually saying, don't have this surgery done. Isn't that fascinating? By using that word, he's referring back to Celsus invention medically, and he's saying, don't have that surgery done. I think that's fascinating. It's like he's taking a stand against a commercial or something like that. Yeah, because possibly some Jewish male converts you know, in Corinth wanted a complete break with Judaism to the point of being you know, even physically altered right here. Has anyone been called in uncircumcision? Middle of verse 18, he moves along. Has anyone been called in uncircumcision? He is not to be circumcised. Well, we just talked about this. We just read Galatians 5, you know, verses 1 through, through 12. You are separated from Christ. You are fallen from grace. You know, this persuasion does not come from God. You know, instead of just snipping off that little bit, let's just mutilate and cut off the whole thing. You know, we've already seen this, that if you get circumcised post the cross, post resurrection, Christ is of no benefit to you because of what that means, because of what that means. That means every person, every Jew, little Jewish individual that the parent brings before uh, the, the, the Jewish, uh, what are they called? Um, um, I'm forgetting what they're called. No, 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 no. It's what they're called now. It's the guy that you hire that actually does the circumcision. They used to be rabbis. Um, and I'm, Yeah, slice and dicers. <laughs> I'm just forgetting what it's called. Uh, I'll think of it later, and I'll call every one of you up and say it's this. Uh, in, in any case, when the parents have this done, they are damning their child. Now, does that mean, wow, that's it right there? Well, well no, of course it doesn't mean that because God is bigger than that. If they're of the elect, he'll save them. And, and not a problem, okay? But, but think about what you're doing to that child now. Think about it. You are fallen from grace. That's why he says, if anyone's been called in uncircumcision, he is not to be circumcised. He is not to be circumcised. You know why? <laughs> because circumcision is, verse 19, what? Nothing. And uncircumcision is is nothing. See that? But what matters is the keeping of the commandments of God. Being circumcised is not going to make you a, com a better commandment keeper. Being uncircumcised is not going to make you a better commandment keeper. It, it's nothing. Isn't it interesting how men use physical things and turn it into something when it's nothing? It's like we pointed this out this morning in the, in the first service in Mark the seventh chapter. 
You know, Jesus talks about the fact of how that the, the scribes and the Pharisees made the traditions that they had developed of equal to or greater than the Word of God themselves, and thereby they nullified the Word of God and the teaching of God by doing so. That's the danger of traditions that are not biblical, absolutely biblical. See? But what they were talking about in the seventh chapter is the Pharisees were complaining that neither Jesus nor the boys were washing their hands in a special way. With the fist is what it means. They'd have two people there and pouring over their hands. They do it a special way. There's a whole ceremony they go through before they, they would eat. And they call that baptizing, by the way. That, that, was, that was baptizing um, in, in the Jewish circle. Uh, and it required two, two people to get that done. Jesus says, man, you're invalidating the word of God by your tradition. And that's the problem here. Because Christ has fulfilled the law, circumcision is nothing. To get circumcised since the cross is to make something out of nothing is the problem right there. Why, verse 19, why is circumcision nothing and uncircumcision uh, nothing? Well, why 18? It's because of verse 19. What matters is the keeping of the commandments of God. Now, please notice something with me. Notice that he says, what matters is the keeping of what? The commandments of God. It does not say the keeping of the? Thank you. The law of God or the laws of God. You will not find that anywhere in the New Testament, in the New Covenant. Not find that. You will find this, the commandments of God, for instance. Um, Christ, Romans 10.4, is the end of the law. For, all, for righteousness for all who will believe. Isn't that a fabulous verse? Romans 10, 4. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for all who will believe. He's done it for us. That's it. It's all wrapped up in him. That's exactly what he said he would do. I didn't come to destroy the law, Matthew 5, 17 and 18. I came to fulfill it. Wonderful. Luke 24, 44. You're probably sick of hearing me say this. Too bad. Jesus appears before the boys, not really, appears before the boys on the day of his resurrection, says, I have fulfilled all that was written about me in the law, the Psalms and the prophets. He did it. He did it. What do you think it meant when he said, to tell us die on the cross, it is finished, the debt is paid. See, done for us. Ephesians 2, 15 and 16, God took the hated enemy, our hated enemy, which was the law contained in ordinances and commandments and nailed it to the cross, killing it off. There's nothing left to keep, ladies and gentlemen. When Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10 says the law is written on our hearts, that's just speaking about your righteousness. That means you don't need somebody to tell you a commandment to know that it's to be done because you're a new creation in Christ. Of course you don't commit adultery. Of course you don't walk around digging, digging holes hoping that your neighbor falls into it. Really? You need a law to tell you not to do that? Of course you don't put your neighbor in a dangerous situation. I mean, how many of you have got a second-story residence, and on top you've, you've built a special fence all the way around the rooftop so that nobody falls off? Really? Do you really need a law that tells you, man, when we were looking at that, at that church building in... Uh, Missouri Valley, some of you who, who got to go out there, you remember that, that sort of secondary choir loft sort of area, that balcony? Kind of, and I'm like, I don't want people going up there because you write, some of you may have gone up there and you stand right at the edge of that thing and the, and the little parapet only goes so high. And it's like, I don't like even standing close to this. And then I saw, you were up there, I think. Saw Josh go up there, and I'm like, oh, and so my heart jumps to my throat. I don't, you know, I, I think, and I said to Keith, we need to lock the door. If we take this place, we need to lock that door so people don't go up there. I think it's dangerous. Really? Do I need a law to tell me that I need to? Well, more than that, more than the common sense thing, the fact that you're a new creation. You already have these things, dare I say it, intuitively. You already have these things inside of you, see? So when somebody says to you, are you a law keeper, watch out, because that's a trap, by the way. Are you a law keeper? Ask for a definition. Don't just walk into that snare, please, okay? Because if you mean a law keeper in that I keep the Sabbath, the Old Covenant Sabbath, and I circumcise my children, and this, that, and the next thing, then the answer is no. 
Do I observe? Because the law means there are seven major feasts and I'm supposed to keep every one of them. No. And by the way, you can't anyway because it all has to be done at the temple in Jerusalem with priests. Good luck with that one. <laughs> Nobody. Could, why do you think, what do you think God is saying the last 2,000 years? He's I'm making a statement here to all you people that are trying to return to Old Covenant Judaism. You can't, can you? You can't. And yet you're all, blah, 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 and doing your crying thing and at the wailing law, blah, 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 blah. what is all that? You say, you mocking? Heck yes, I'm mocking. That is a godless, dead religion. Of course. It's opposed to biblical Christianity. It is opposed to God himself. God's opposed to it. He says, what's wrong with you guys? I have changed the rules. I've changed the plans. It's been fulfilled. You can't do it. Look at you guys trying to do it anyway. Take that yarmulke off your head. I never said to do that. See, there you go. The things. Okay. Say, can you calm down, Pastor? Well, yeah, I can calm down to a certain degree. He says, circumcision, nothing. Uncircumcision, nothing. What matters is the commandments of God. In John 14 and verse 15, John 14, just give you a quick taste. In verse 15, Jesus said, if you love me, you will tereo, guard. My commandments. Obey. Keep. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. What were his commandments? Well, there. Boom. Ba-bang. Frank's on it again. You know, the two greatest commandments. The, the guy comes to Jesus and says, what's the greatest commandment of the law? Love God. And then love your neighbor as yourself. On those two commandments hangs all the law and the prophets, he says. And so Paul will then say in Romans the 13th chapter, he who loves has fulfilled the law. Congratulations. You know? So, so when the person comes, you say, are you a law keeper? You say, I'm a law fulfiller. <laughs> he who loves has fulfilled the law. Well, that's not what I'm saying. Well, that's what God's saying, buddy. Let's get back in line with the Lord. What do you say? Look at verse 21, same chapter. He who has my commandments and keeps them, verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. My commandments. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. I'll love him and disclose myself to him. You know, John likes to say the same thing in 1 John, you know, keeping the commandments of God, commandments of God. Come on, that's not talking about the law. It's talking about the, law, the commands of Christ. Those are built on the law, and the law, are we saying chuck the law? No. The law is good, it's holy, it's perfect, absolutely. Romans uh, 7.12 says. Yeah, absolutely. But, but, but keep in mind that 2 Corinthians 3.6, the law kills, but the Spirit gives life. What has been cut away from me that I feel I need to get back? Do you really need to? Or is your relationship with Christ and the promises of the Word that are yours already, the exceeding, 2 Peter 1, 4, exceeding great and precious promises that are yours, that make you a share in the divine nature, is that not sufficient to heal you up from what's been taken from you? I say yes. I say yes. And, and you need to say yes. You need to say yes. No loss uh, is greater than cannot be overcome by the truth of the Word of God in these matters. Second point on your outline now. A slave life. A life lived at somebody else's pleasure. Looking at verse 20. He says, each man must remain in that condition in which he was called. So he's repeating this. He's saying, he's saying don't do anything about this circumcised thing. And now he's saying, each man must remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Don't worry about it. See, this is about contentment, isn't it? Saved when one is a slave does not necessarily mean being removed from that life. A person who is in a societal position he doesn't want to be in can still serve Christ faithfully and participate in all of Christ's benefits. All the slaves that were believers did. Uh, look at, look at uh, or make a note of Ephesians 6, verses 5 through 8. Ephesians 6, verses 5 through 8. 
says, Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh. Why do you have to say that? Because there was a little bit of an uppity thing that was going on in some of the churches amongst the slaves saying, well, here in the church, we're all like equal. Why can't it be that way when we're away from the church? Paul has to say, that's not the way society works. Paul's not saying this is a great society. Paul's saying, Paul's saying, Paul's recognizing the fact that you, you can't start some sort of a rebellion, a revolution amongst slaves and expect the gospel to be given any kind of a hearing, a fair hearing, when you're blowing away society. He's saying, he's saying work within it. We're going to talk about what slavery was, because when you hear the word slave, don't think in terms of the USA pre-civil, pre and civil, you know, post-war. Pre-civil war, post-civil war. Don't think about it in those types of, in that type of way, because it was different. It was, it was a different situation. He says, with fear and trembling in the sincerity of Christ, in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. That's what a slave of Christ is. Doing the will of God from your heart. I want to do what God wants me to do. Here's this passage of Scripture, and it's telling me to do something. I'm like, ah, I really don't want to do it, but Lord, change my heart. Help me to want to do this as your will from my heart. That's what we have to do. He says, with good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men. He's speaking to societal slaves here who are in the church, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, look at this. This he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. Masters do the same things to them. Give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven. There is no partiality with him. So masters, I got something to say to you. Quit threatening them. It goes both ways, see? But notice that verse 8 says, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free in particular. Same is true for somebody uh, who's in a different occupation. They feel like they're in an occupation that's like slavery. I'm like a slave to this job. Well, then Colossians 2.23 is your watchword. Colossians 2.23, whatever you do, do your work heartily as unto the Lord rather than to men. Colossians 3.23. Now, let's talk about this slavery issue in the Roman Empire. Slavery issue in the Roman Empire. Here's a shocking statement. Did you know that in Paul's day, about 50% of the population of the Roman Empire was made up of slaves? Yeah, about 50%. Pretty well documented, too. That's a lot of slaves, you know. Um, what do you think that empire was like, made up of that many people who were supposed to be slaves? Was it really that debilitating? Because we, th we think of it in those kind of terms. <clears throat> but there are different levels of slaves. Slaves in the Roman Empire were often better educated, better skilled, more literate than the average Roman citizen. That's right. A large percentage of these people, watch this, were doctors, lawyers, they were accountants, they were teachers, they were slaves. And they lived well. Some slaves own slaves. Yeah, they own slaves. It's because of what slavery was back then. Now, that's not to say I'm painting a picture that slavery was not such a bad idea and it was all rosy and there wasn't any problems. Oh, no, 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 no. Yes, there was. And if you're thinking in terms of some of the abuses that could happen, if you think I'm saying those abuses didn't happen, I'm not saying that because they did. There were those who had masters that were very cruel and oppressive and hurtful and vindictive. Sure, we had that. Why do you think some of them ran? Some of them would run. Uh, one, of, one of Paul's very important epistles, the epistle to Philemon, right? It's his last epistle that we have in the order here uh, in our New Testament documents. Just, just one chapter right there. Fascinating book. I've taught on it uh, here at Messiah before. I'll, I'll teach on it again, no doubt. But, but Paul actually has to say to Philemon, look, you had a slave named Onesimus, and he ran away from you. Well, there's a reason, and Philemon's supposed to be a Christian at Colossae. He attended the Colossian church. 
And Paul writes this letter to the whole church about this issue. And uh, Onesimus ran away from Philemon. You got to ask the question, why did he run? What was going on? Yeah, what was going on? Short story is, is that Onesimus becomes a Christian through Paul's ministry. And now Paul's writing this letter because Onesimus wants to come back and make things right because he's a new creation in Christ now. And Philemon's going, I don't think so. Or there's some kind of heartburn. And Paul has to stand up and actually get the witnesses of the church and say, you know what, if he owes you anything, implying that he stole something, maybe some cash or something to get on the road, he says, credit that to me, I'll, I'll repay it. And then, he go, and then he goes ahead through some steps that's pretty easy to recognize if you, re, if you know the language, but, but Paul is actually offering to buy Philemon, uh, Onesimus, in, from Philemon in order to set him free. And then he says, to Philemon in front of the rest of the church, Onesimus could actually take uh, Philemon's place with me in the ministry. In other words, your slave is good enough to do your job, Paul says. Ouch! Huh? See? That's an important little book because it's all about that whole societal setting and what slaves meant uh, in the Roman Empire. And then we have an, uh, an example of it right there. Oftentimes when a slave wanted to be uh, uh, remitted from slavery, um, it would be either being sold off by the master or they die. (laughs) That was their ultimate freedom right there. But they could also buy themselves out. Yeah. Um, A master uh, could agree uh, that an individual will come and be their slave to work off a debt. And this happened from time to time. And it was for an agreed upon time. And if they didn't work off the debt within that time, then the master had the legal rights to take that person as well as his family and sell them off on the slave auction block to others. Maybe they get a good situation. Maybe they don't. If they're well educated, then they'll probably be put in a better circumstance than if they weren't well educated, you see. Because you had slaves who were out in the field. You had slaves that worked in the house. You had slaves that worked in professional occupations under the master, like accountants, bookkeepers, this kind of a thing. But then you had those who were, who were doctors and lawyers and, 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 and along these lines. It's a, it's a fascinating subject. And oh, by the way, out on the book table is a great book by John MacArthur. It's called Slave. And I brought this up once before. If you haven't read it, I really encourage you to read it. And uh, Frank's also put a, an audio copy out there for anybody that wants to borrow that uh, as well. But it's out there on the table. And he really demonstrates why. He not only talks about the background of these folks, but he really talks about the fact why Paul keeps bringing this analogy up that we are slaves to Christ. And he really spends a lot of time pointing out that there is a difference, by the way, between the word servant and the word slave. Uh, Slurvent, uh, slurvent, a a servant, (laughs) you know, last uh, brother, uh, brother Keith was graciously preaching for me last week. And I noticed that he had some slips of the tongue because I watch everything on YouTube. I watch all the guys that come up here and I, and I, I just feel for you, man. I know what you mean by that. It's like, Right. So slurvent, okay. <laughs> Diakonos is our Greek word for servant. But a, but a servant was not a slave. Uh, a slave was a doulos. Uh, you'll see in some translations, bond slave. That's very accurate. Bond slave. And we are referred to as bond slave. Paul calls himself uh, a slave for that matter. Servant was a hired individual. Would come in, perform the job, and go home. But a slave was not hired, they were owned. They could not speak for themselves. It was just whatever the behest of the master was, you see. And that's how it is with you and I in regards to the person of Christ, except we don't have a master who's a hard, bitter taskmaster. We have a just Savior, but we are his doulos. We are his bond slaves. When Paul closes down the letter to the Galatians, he says, from this point on, let nobody bother me anymore, for I bear in my body the bond slave markings of Christ, the lashes, the whipping, the evidence that I have witnessed for Christ, you see. 
Verse 22 really does comment back on verse 21, but let's look at 21. Were you called while a slave? Don't worry about it. But if you are able to become free, rather do that. Sure. If you can come out of it, do it. For he who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who was called while free is Christ's slaves. Earthly bondage socially is not as great as spiritual bondage to sin. The slave can know that in Christ they have been freed from a greater bondage. That's the focus. All believers are the Lord's freed men in that case. In that we are freed from the power of sin. Romans 6, just write it down. Romans 6, verses 16 through 18. Oh, Romans 6, verses 16 through 18. Now, who were the freedmen? What you, you know, that was a specific class of people. You know, you'll even see them in the book of Acts. talks about the synagogue of the freedmen. Those were former slaves. Uh, libertinus, or libertinius, I believe it is in Latin. And this was a class of people that they were free, but as a freedman, listen to this now, because Paul uses this specific word, as a freedman, they still owed a measure of allegiance and responsibility to their former masters. They were free, but they were in a separate class. They were freed from that obligation to the master. But at the same time, there was service uh, to members of the master's household. Well, guess what? It's the exact same thing for us. In Christ, we are the Lord's freed man. You see that? He was called in the Lord, for he who was called in the Lord, 22 while a slave, is the Lord's freed man. But we're still obligated back to our master who set us free. Isn't that fabulous? Likewise, he who was called while free is Christ's slave. To those in, in the Corinthian congregation who would think of themselves higher than the Christian slaves, this is comment is for them. They too, like the actual slaves, are slaves themselves. Paul himself referred to himself as a doulos. Romans 1.1 1, 1. Paul, a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. He did it in Philippians 1 verse 1 and he included Timothy in that, referring to them both as doulos or douloi, the plural, of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said it again about himself in Titus 1 and verse 1. He doesn't mind doing that. And he understands that the people receiving this letter in Greek would get the implications of that. That Paul really is not unto, he's not free unto himself. He has been set free, but he's a freed man. He still has an obligation tethering him back to his master and to the member of the master's household. Isn't that beautiful? That picture that he paints right there, using a societal word, freed man, to show that not we're free, but we have a responsible back to the master and to the members of their household. That's the church. That's the church, isn't it? Which brings us to the third and final point. Third and final point is a purchased life, a life free from forced slavery. Let's look at verse 23 and 24. He says, you were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. You were slaves, but you were bought with a price. To the slave who wanted to have someone buy them, the actual slave, and free them, he speaks of uh, the purchase price. But he speaks of the purchase price of Christ's blood. What he's saying to the slaves uh, who were not freed yet from the obligation of their masters who were there in the Corinthian church, he says, guess what? You have already been bought. You've already been bought with that purchase price. You've already been set free. You're set free to a greater freedom. You're free, Romans 6, from the power of sin in your lives. He says in verse 16 of Romans 6, Do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves, this is doulos by the way, of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or obedience resulting in righteousness. Here we go. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. 
20, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. It just doesn't get any better than that. He's wanting to point out to these slaves in Corinth that they had been set free, as a matter of fact. The purchase price, verse 23, you were bought with a price, has been paid for them. 1 Peter 1, verse 18 and 19 tells us what that purchase price was. 1 Peter 1 and verse 18, not 2 Peter, Kelly. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile, empty way of life inherited from your forefathers. By the way, that's referring to the Jews. That's talking about the Jewish background, their forefathers. All right? They had been purchased out of that, but with the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. They're free. They're free. Yeah, but I'm stuck in this slavery. I feel like a slave. You're free. And by the way, the Lord can enter in and change that, but it sounds like your heart is the problem first that needs to be changed. Your attitude is what needs to be adjusted. That's what it sounds like to me. But I could be wrong. I was once, but then I realized I was mistaken. All right. Purchased with the blood of Christ. In fact, the entire church has been bought and purchased with the blood of Christ. Acts 20, verse 28 says that God purchased the church with His own blood. Revelation 5, 9 says that with the blood of Christ, He has purchased men out of every kingdom, nation, people, and tribe on the face of the earth. Purchased with the blood of Christ. The purchase price has matter of fact, been paid. And so because of that, in verse 23, because you've been bought with that price, do not become slaves of men. Once the slave had been set free, by the way, once the, once the societal slave has been set free, for whatever, whatever way that it happened, um, there was the danger of, often this took place, and I found this interesting to read about, that many times, often, they were faced with the danger of going back out into the world and not being able to do as well financially and live as well as when they were slaves. Right. And so we hear stories every now and then about a guy who's been in the prison system, current time, and he's been in for 20 years or whatever like that. It's like he goes out and he commits a crime so he can go back in because it was easier for him on the inside than it is on the outside. This is what was taking place in first century a Roman Empire. These guys would sometimes find that they couldn't live as well and get themselves into debt again or something, sometimes unintentional, sometimes intentional, get sold back into slavery. Now that was a real roll of the dice because maybe you got back into a good situation, maybe you didn't. Maybe you got back under a cruel Master, But why does he say this here? Verse 23, if you've been bought with a price, do not become slaves of men. He's saying no returning back to that fallen system of fallen man once you've been purchased out of it. There's no returning. That's what he means by that. Don't become slaves of men. And verse 24 really offers a conclusion uh, to what we've been reading about here. Verse 24 Brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition supplied in which he was called. Now, meneto uh, paratheo. Meneto paratheo is the phrase in Greek which means, uh, that's been translated here, remain with God. But para has the idea of alongside. Paraclete, that word for the Holy Spirit that Jesus uses in John 14, 15, and 16. Paraclete. It's one called alongside. Cleat is from kaleo, to call, para, alongside, to call alongside. Well, here what this is really saying, I, I would prefer it translated this way, maneto paratheo means to abide or live with God at your side. Para, at your side. In other words, God is at your side supporting you in the condition in which he has placed you, supporting you in that condition in which he has placed you. So, brethren, you can remain in that condition with God because he's supporting you. He's, he's right by your side. 
He's right by your side in that circumstance. And, you know, a lot of times, and I've been there too, okay? I've been there too with, with you. You could be in a circumstance in your home, in your job, you know, with your relationship with other people, and it's like you're like, man, I hate this. I hate, And we're sitting there and we're stewing in it, right? We're stewing in that situation. And God is right there waiting for us to stop sinning. <laughs> I had to come to that realization one time. I'm going, oh, gosh, Lord, it's me, you know, kind of a thing. Wherein we're in this circumstance, we're in this situation, and, you know, oh, 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 I hate it, hate it. You know, I know what you mean by that because I've done the same thing. And it's like the, this text says, the Lord's there. He's there with me in my situation. Verse 17 already says that he is assigned and called uh, each uh, in the manner in which we are walking or living. That includes your employment and other situations as well. And God's right there to make the change. See, he's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. He's right there in all of that. So what are we going to do? Are we going to keep grousing? Are we going to keep sinning? Or are we going to recognize, man, Lord, okay, you're in charge. You can change this anytime. But I recognize that my attitude needs to change. I've got to stop sinning in front of you. I, I, and I, I'm stopping right now. Lord, please forgive me. I'm sorry. Just, just help me, Lord, to not keep walking back into that. And it becomes a habit because the longer you do it, you know, the more you're used to you know, sinning in this way. And we, we end up repeating it, repeating it, repeating it, repeating it. Right? So it may take a little bit of time for you to get an adjustment thing going. But start. But start. So let me conclude this uh, with four little bullet points, four little final thoughts to drop on you that sort of wraps all this up. We've already discovered from verse 17 that the Lord has assigned and called us to our present state of living. Lord's a part of that. And that this really, if we have a problem with that, we don't like what we're doing, how we're doing it, who we're with, blah, 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 blah. It's really an issue of contentment, isn't it? Because of Philippians 4, verses 10 through 13. I have discovered and I have learned that in whatever state I am in, to be content. I have learned to be content with much, to be content with little. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Strengthens me for what? To be content. Strengthens me to be content. You know, maybe you've, you've, maybe you've got yourself into this yourself. Maybe... You know, it's your actions that have got you into this present circumstance. Confess that before the Lord. Ask Him for forgiveness if it's sin. Turn away from that. And don't be hammering yourself with some, you know, sledgehammer of guilt about it. You let it go. Please. For your sake and for all of our sake. Because we need you. We need you whole. Not hung up. And then watch the Lord. Watch the Lord. That you can still ask Him to change. Now you're in a position to ask Him to change it. Because there's no barrier now. And so ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. Because he who keeps asking, what? Receives. He who keeps knocking, what? The door will be open for him. Oh my gosh. And why does the door never get open? We stop knocking. We stop. Well, don't stop. Secondly, like circumcision was performed on an eight-day-old eight boy without his permission, so we have had things removed from us by others. How much longer are you going to stay with that? He or she did X, Y, and Z to me 29, 39 years ago, and I've never forgotten it. The only person that is hurting is you. <laughs> it's only beaten on you. How much longer? Not to mention the fact that Ephesians 5, at the end of Ephesians 5, it says that we are to forgive one another as God in Christ, as God in Christ, I'm sorry, as God in Christ has forgiven us. And that's fully and freely. Yeah, but I can't function because this was done to me. I don't have this in my life. I don't have that in my life. You know, and I'm focusing on what I don't have. And Paul says, it's nothing. 
circumcision, the cutting off, the removal, nothing. It's nothing. Can you say that? Or, or is that thing so damn important to you? That it's actually better and you actually want the comfort. You're so used to the comfort of that complaint and that bitterness that I don't have this thing or this was done to me. And if I, if I lose this, if I don't have it anymore, well, I, I don't know what that's going to do to me, you know, kind of a thing. So I'm just going to kind of keep that and keep complaining about it. You're going to kill yourself. And guess what? You're of no use to us. Wow, that's a cruel thing to say. But you see, you're hung up in this sin and this bitterness and you can't minister to anybody. That's all I'm saying. Loose, loose, be loosed. It's nothing. Thirdly, Christ paid your purchase price to release you from the slavery of sin. Do not return to that slavery. Fourth and last, no matter what condition you are in socially, God is at your side. Paratheo. God is at your side to lead you through it. And Hebrews 13.5 still hasn't changed. He says five negatives in Greek. I will never, never leave you. Never, never, never forsake you. It's just us who do the forsaking. It's us who do the leaving. It's us that bring the problem. What kind of a life has God assigned to you. These points, I think, will help us to clarify it and to live where God has us right now. Can it be changed? Sure. He can change it. And I know that circumstances can vary. Situations can vary. But isn't it fascinating how that in the midst of chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians, after he goes through this long harangue about marriages and relationships, right? That then he makes a sharp jerk turn with the steering wheel and says, I'm going to answer this question now. Right in the middle of all of this. I wonder why. Well, I think some of it probably has to do with spouses, either male or female, that are blaming their other spouse for the condition in which they find themselves now.